Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Armand Dodgar. I'm one of the co-founders uh, and CTO at HashiCorp. And I thought I would kick us off with a bit of a high-level introduction. I'm not sure if uh, everyone is sort of level set on kind of the broader HashiCorp. So focus a little bit on what does HashiCorp kind of more broadly focus on? What's our sort of you know, product portfolio? I think oftentimes we're known more for the, the products themselves than for the company name. I think most folks will recognize you know, Vagrant and Terraform and, and Console and Vault, but not necessarily uh, HashiCorp the company. Uh, so starting maybe at kind of the highest level, I think from you know, the HashiCorp perspective, we're really focused on cloud infrastructure automation, right? And so when we talk about cloud infrastructure automation, I think most people think fairly low level. If they're familiar with Terraform, they might be jumping to thinking about strictly IaaS and automation at that layer of bringing up VMs and managing things there. Um, but I think for us, it's real. Us, it's a really a pretty broad and holistic sense of things we think about. So I think for most users. What we acknowledge is great. We're probably starting from a place of being in private data center, right? If you're a large existing business that's been around 10, 20, 50 years, uh, you probably didn't start life in the cloud. So a large part of your estate is probably on premises. From there, we're very likely to be adopting private data center, but alongside several preferred cloud providers, right? So our view is most likely you know, for every large institution, you're gonna end up with an all of the above strategy, right? And so I think this is dri driven really by two different things. One is just M&A, right? Uh, you're buying another company, you happen to go all in on AWS, you bought a different company that happened to go all in on Azure, and now, you know, welcome to multi-cloud. The other is I think very sort of organic bottoms up interest, right? Uh, and I think this is driven through things like, hey, you have a data analyst team, they really want to leverage some of the AI ML features uh, on GCP, great. You have a team that wants to use managed SharePoint or managed Microsoft services uh, on Azure. Uh, and then you might be using some of the more developer-centric features on AWS. So I think there's various reasons that you're going to get this kind of bottom up. But I think our view is from a technology standpoint, there's this consistent sort of uh, you know, reality for large enterprises that they're gonna be multi-cloud and sort of all of the above, right? From there, I think there's a question about process transformation as well, right? I think when we look at the classic private data center, it tends to be very much an ITIL or ITSM approach or sort of file a ticket and wait, right? So if I'm a developer and I want a VM, I file a ticket and I wait a few days. If I want my firewall updated, I file a ticket and I wait a few days, right? Same thing for my load balancer or my TLS certificates, et cetera, et cetera. And so what you find is that this is a process that has very little sort of agility, right? It might be that over time, you start to talk about weeks or months to actually deliver an application and that new application to production. So when we talk to people about, well, what are you looking for when you talk about cloud? You're gonna hear things like, I want CI, CD, I want agile, I want DevOps. Right? And I think from our perspective, it's really about self-service. Right? How do I get to a point where my different internal developers can self-service the infrastructure they need rather than waiting you know, days or weeks for someone else to fulfill a ticket on their behalf? Right? So if I kind of combine these two trends, the sort of technology replatforming that's taking place along with the process transformation that's taking place, I think this is what HashiCorp likes to refer to as our cloud operating model. And the reason we call it specifically an operating model is I think the cloud piece of it is actually sort of optional, right? So what we've seen with some of even you know, our largest customers is they start down this journey of, hey, we wanna adopt cloud. It's about focusing on agility. It's about improving our time to market. And as they start going down this path, they realize it's a new set of tools they need to bring in. It's a new set of process. It's a new set of workflow. And as they start developing and rolling that out, what you start to realize is as you start adopting that, you can apply it on premise, right? Because it doesn't really have a hard dependency on cloud. It's a way of thinking, it's a way of operating. And so you can actually achieve a lot of that same efficiency, that self-service entirely on premise, right? So the cloud part of it uh, is optional, right? I'm not saying that there aren't compelling reasons for cloud, but I think a lot of what we think about as being the sort of agility problems actually stems from a process problem, right? So from our perspective, it's a question of great, as we wanna achieve this, this sort of self-service capability, what are the different folks that we need to work with across a, an IT organization? And I think for us, we kind of categorize it in four different layers, right? At the base layer is provisioning, 
right? I'm largely focused on IT operations. And I think the challenge there is how do you manage infrastructure sort of cradle to grave, right? Day one, I want to stand up a new set of VMs. Day two, I want to scale up and down. Day three, I want to reconfigure. Day four, I don't need it anymore and I want to take it out of service. So it's that full life cycle when we talk about provisioning that really matters, right? And so here is where our Terraform tool uh, is popularly used. And we'll kind of come back and spend a few minutes talking about that. At the next level up, it's thinking about security, right? And so historically, this has been the focus of security teams internally, as one would expect. But increasingly, this is a focus from ops people as well, right? And I think what's changing at the security layer is our focus used to be on a very perimeter-centric approach, right? So secure the kind of four walls of the data center, put all of our defenses, at, you know, the firewall, the WAF, the SIM, everything in kind of the front door, and then sort of assert that the inside of the four walls is secure, right? As we go to cloud, we lose the four walls, right? We don't have the perimeter in the same sense, right? And so I think this changes our approach pretty fundamentally, right? We still have to think about at a base layer, how do we provide access to infrastructure, right? SSHing into machines, RDP, things like that. How do we provide, manage access to the, the cloud keys themselves, right? The management plane, the middleware layers, right? Databases, API keys, TLS certificates, et cetera. And then all the way at the very top is application data, right? How do we actually protect app data at rest and in transit between our services? So this is where our big focus is on with Vault, uh, I think relatively well-known tool at this point. The next layer up is connectivity, right? How do we actually wire all of our different applications and services together, right? Historically, this was something our networking team would focus on, right? They'd rack and stack the Cisco gear, set up our physical network, and then sort of are decoupled from application lifecycle. You're going to notice a trend here, but as we go to cloud, everything is an ops problem, right? And the reason for that is the network isn't a physical thing anymore. We're not racking and stacking the Cisco gear. As I'm spinning up a new you know, Amazon VPC to do you know, dev test work in, that thing needs a network. It needs to be peered back with my other networks, right? So the definition of the network itself is logical and lives and sort of has to coexist with sort of the definition of the application and the infrastructure itself, right? So we'll spend a lot more time on that uh, today. And this is really where our console product is focused on. And at the very top of the stack is what's the runtime, right? And so the runtime is ultimately designed to be consumed by our developers, right? They wanna deploy their applications, scale up and down, you know, do blue greens, et cetera. It tends to be underpinned and supported by operations, right? So here's where we would put our Nomad product. Uh, similarly, you might put like Kubernetes or something up at this top level, right? So our general view sort of stepping back is in each of these sort of different layers, what we're trying to solve is fundamentally a coordination problem between teams, right? And what I mean by that is let's take that top layer, the runtime layer. Historically, what we might have done is as a developer, if I wanted to deploy my app, I'd file a ticket and throw it over the fence to operations, right? So the, the interface, if you will, between development and operations was a ticket, right? If I want a certificate, I'd file a ticket from my development org against you know, my security team or my PKI team and say, hey, I need a certificate for my application. So again, the interface between them is a ticket. So where does something like Ansible fit into this layered framework? It's a super good question. I think you kind of layer it somewhere in this kind of provisioning layer. And I think the reason I say somewhat is I think there's a broad range of how we see Ansible get used. One is it might be developer sort of used Ansible, in which case it might be closer to runtime, right? We see organizations that use Ansible to actually deploy their applications. Uh, that's sort of one mode. I think another more common one is that we see Ansible's used by operators to really manage the underlying infrastructure. And it's a bit more plumbing. It's kind of hidden from the developers. So in that kind of more plumbing use case, it typically is getting invoked you know, by Terraform or alongside with Terraform. So Terra the analogy I've heard that I really enjoy is like Terraform is sort of the city planner right? It's going to lay down the streets and the lights and the buildings and things like that. And then, you know, Ansible is your interior decorator, right? So once the, you know, the building is stood up, then you use Ansible to, you know, arrange the furniture and set up the, you know, the paint colors and the fixtures on the inside of it, right? So that's, you know, I, I think a good analogy for it. Okay. Yeah, this is, I think, a good pause point, or if there's other sort of questions about sort of our, our framing and kind of how we think about the broader stack. So does Nomad, Nomad uh, is it uh, a Kubernetes-like 
container orchestration solution or is it you know is it something on top of kubernetes or or alongside kubernetes or yeah it's underneath super kubernetes good, <laughs> super good question so it, it's distinct from kubernetes it's neither sort of above or below um, and i guess the the biggest way we describe the difference is nomad is sort of fundamentally uh, multi-platform right so it runs on windows runs on linux runs on sort of bsds etc it's also multiple package formats. And what I mean by that is like Kubernetes, when you think about it, it's strictly a container orchestrator. Containers are an important workload for Nomad, but not the only one, right? And so you can actually use Nomad to deploy VMs using KVM. Uh, if you have static Java applications or a Windows IIS application or a C++ static binary that's been compiled, you can hand that to Nomad and it can orchestrate the deploy of those, right? So it doesn't have to be strictly containerized. And then there's experimental drivers for things like Amazon's Firecracker or uh, a, a sort of a WebAssembly driver as well. So you might have a compiled WebAssembly app uh, and Nomad can orchestrate the deploy of it. So I think from our perspective, the way we think about Nomad is it's a generic application sort of deployment tool. The actual format is sort of designed to be pluggable. So whether it's deploying a Docker container or you know a VM is sort of agnostic to Nomad. Because I think the, the workflow is I think what we care about. And if I'm deploying a VM or a container, I still want to do things like canary deploys or blue-green deploys. You know, I want to handle multiple data centers and do rolling upgrades. So it sort of doesn't matter from a package format perspective, right? Nomad is agnostic. I think it's about enabling those sort of self-service workflows around, hey, my developer wants to do a blue-green deploy or a canary. You know, how do I automate that? So I think that's one piece of it. I think the other thing that we end up saying quite commonly is from a deployment pattern, you know, the average Nomad cluster size is probably 500 plus nodes, right? You know, customers run it in the thousands to tens of thousands of nodes. And so I think the Nomad paradigm tends to have, you have a few very large Nomad clusters. So as a central ops team, I might run a dev stage prod cluster that's huge and have 200 app teams on it versus I think what we see with Kubernetes is sort of the inverse, right? If I have 200 app teams, I have 200 Kubernetes clusters, right? And the average size might be, you know, a dozen nodes. So I think just depends on what we what organizations you know prefer. Do they prefer kind of a strong central platform that's multi-tenant versus lots of independent kind of Kubernetes clusters? All right, so, thanks. Um, that, that's a great, really great breakdown of the difference between Nomad and Kubernetes. I really appreciate that uh, call out. So from a architectural perspective, this centralized uh, approach versus this distributed everyone has a uh k a kubernetes cluster and kind of does their own thing when you think when you bring in things like service discovery and etc does hashicorp kind of uh provide an opinionated view of how you do that when you adopt a nomad so you have a centralized service discovery etc yeah, it's a super good question. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think unlike Kubernetes, which is a bit more of a, you know, I'll call it kind of like all the all the pieces are sort of uh, included, if you will, with Kubernetes as an opinionated way of service discovery and secrets and all that kind of stuff. Nomad takes a much thinner lens, right, and says it's just focused on the application deployment piece of it. And the expectation is that it's being composed with a tool like console for service discovery or a tool like vault to do secret management. So I think, you know, one of the things we hold near and dear is sort of the Unix philosophy, right? So with all of our tools, our goal is do one thing, do it well, and then compose with other things. So to your question of sort of like, what's the prescriptive approach to service discovery if I'm using something like, uh, you know, Nomad, it's very much, yeah, pair it with console. And then they have a very tight integration between the two. So Nomad and console, you kind of get a one plus one equals three, right? So Nomad is aware of console, it'll automatically do the service registrations, do the right tagging for things like blue, green, or canary type deployments. And so there's a tight integration there uh, that's relatively opinionated in terms of like how they should be used together. Yeah, that's a great question. Cool. So I think, you know, in some sense, I think what you could kind of abstract all of our tools is it's really about this notion of what's the system of coordination between sort of the internal consumer and who the producer team is on the other side, right? And so you can kind of fill it in, in, in sort of different ways of who's the consumer, who's the producer for each of our products. You know, the example I think we just talked through was, was Nomad, where I'd say, hey, my consumer is the developer internally. What they want is a northbound API, if I want to sort of refer to this as that, right? The northbound API, 
allows a developer to say, I want to deploy a new app. I want to scale up and down. I want to do a blue green. Oh, something went wrong, do a rollback. Those are sort of northbound type of concerns versus in this case, my southbound would be sort of an ops person, right? Or an ops team who's responsible for standing up this cluster. And it's a very different set of concerns. You're not really worried about app lifecycle of you know, deploying a new version. It's more about, hey, does the cluster have enough capacity? If I need to patch the underlying OS nodes, can I take, you know, take these 50 machines out of service so I can patch the OS and then reintroduce them to the cluster, right? If there's not enough capacity, scale the cluster up, add additional nodes, right? Do maintenance activity. So I think with all of our tools, really thinking about it through this lens of there's a northbound consumer, we're trying to enable them to have self-service. There's a southbound team that's supporting this. How do they have enough visibility and control to do what they need to do, right? So if I'm the operator, I might say, great, there's a, you know, I'm, I'm running on a version of RHEL that has a security vulnerability. I need to do a patch. Do I really want to coordinate with a hundred different app teams to say, hey, move your workload so I can patch this? Or do I have the right API in place to say, drain these 50 nodes, let me patch it and reintroduce it. And I can do that without having to coordinate with the app team, right? So in this sense, I think the key distinction from like something like an iTeller or ticket-driven view is I don't want to strongly coordinate between the producer and consumer and use a ticket. I want to put a software system in the middle and use that to kind of decouple the workflows. Each of these teams can now run independently of one another, but the, act the activity is sort of coordinated, right? And so I could, you know, we use Nomad as the example here. You could just as easily swap out console or vault or Terraform. You know, in console's case, you know, actually we'll talk about console more de depth in a second. So maybe we'll use vault as an example. It might still be my developer who's the top end sort of consumer, but instead of ops, it's now security who's the producer, right? So security might say, great, I want to govern the policies of how do you have access to a database? How do you have access to cloud keys? Things like that. I might not want to give you, let's say an Amazon IAM token that ever lives more than 24 hours, right? So one approach would be every time you want an Amazon token, you file a ticket against me, I manually create an IAM key and give it back to you, right? This doesn't scale particularly well. Or I set up and deploy Vault as a security team, I configure Vault to say, great, a user can request you know, an Amazon key, they only ever get it for 24 hours at a time, it's restricted to only these capabilities. And that API, the Vault API, is what the customer now uses, right? As a developer, I can hit the Vault API, say, I need an IAM key, Vault auto-generates it according to the policy specified by my security team, and now I can get that self-service without having to be in sort of the execution path, basically, right? So I think kind of a good mental model, and I think what this sort of, for us, it goes back to that true north of what we're really trying to solve ultimately is a workflow problem, right? It's that I want self-service, that's what's going to let me have my developer agility, the rest of it's kind of plumbing, right, to be honest. So I think that's the general framing we use. Now, what I want to do is go a little bit deeper on console just to set the framing, right, for the rest of it. I know we have a broad portfolio, but only so, only so much time today. So with console, I think, you know, actually, before I do that, any questions on kind of the broader full full stack or portfolio view before I switch gears into, into more detail? Yeah, actually, how tightly coupled is the philosophy to the product? So, you know, the, obviously I can interchange some other open source projects, or et, et cetera, to uh, give the functionality of a Terraform, a vault, a console, or even Nomad. I can replace Nomad completely with K8, Kubernetes yep. if I want it. So how, how tightly coupled is the philosophy? If I want to adopt the HashiCorp philosophy, but not the products, can I do that? Super, super good question. Yeah, so I think what we, you know, we publish, you know, very, very proudly what we call the Tau of HashiCorp, right? And the Tau sort of captures what's our, our design ethos across all of these tools. And I think I, I sort of mentioned a few of them in passing, but, you know, number one, the most important for us is orientation around workflow as opposed to technology, right? And so that shines, for example, when I talk about Nomad, it doesn't care, do you want to deploy a VM, a container, a function? Great, those are technology choices. It's about the workflow of, I want self-service, I want a decoupling of these groups, et cetera. So that one's super, super important. The other one is things like Unix philosophy, right? You'll notice each of the tools has a very well-defined scope and they're designed to compose well with one another, right? So if I want to use console and vault together, great, I get a one plus one equals three. If I want, you know, nomad and console together, great, I get that one plus one equals three. So they're designed to be very focused, but also very composable. And I think one of the other ones that probably are, you know, my, one of my favorites is pragmatism, which is, yeah, 
you know, probably a majority of HashiCorp customers are not going to adopt the full HashiCorp stack, right? That's just not pragmatic, right? And so how do they get some of the value? How do they get some of the philosophy without necessarily having to be all in or all out, right? So I think in general, what we find with the vast majority of our users is they start with just one, right? It might be, hey, my most pressing problem is, you know, great, I deployed Kubernetes and I want, a, you know, a better secret management solution. I'm going to start, you know, and the first tool I might use from HashiCorp is Vault, right? Or great, I'm stepping foot into cloud and I just want, you know, a better way to manage my infrastructure. I might just start with Terraform. So it really doesn't require that it's sort of an all in or all out, right? You can kind of pick one place. And with things like Kubernetes, we have deep integration across the stack. With things like Ansible, Chef, Puppet, we have integrations across the stack. So our general view is let's be super pragmatic. There's a ton of technologies out there. There's going to be different reasons people use it, whether they're business reasons because they get a good deal, whether it's sort of preference reasons, whether it's just historic, you know, this is the path we took, right? Let's be pragmatic that that's just the real world and let's just support all of that stuff, right? And great, if you choose to use the full HashiCorp stack, our goal is to get that kind of one plus one equals three effect. But if you want to just pick and choose pieces of it, that's also totally fine by us. I have a follow-up question to that. So, um, I, and there you're not going to talk, it doesn't sound like you're going to talk much about Terraform, but you have a new Terraform as a service um, product. And I know lots of companies do have Terraform embedded into their product offerings. So um, having said what you just said, um, will, will those all blend together? Are you going to be more, so are, what will happen to the companies that have Terraform embedded into what they have now? Is it going to be, will they be able to work with the Terraform service that you're providing or how does that all work together? Yeah, it's a super good question. So I think the relationship between, and so I think the service you're referring to is Terraform Cloud. Mm -hmm. um, and so the analogy I like to use is thinking about sort of Git and GitHub, right? And what I mean by that is like Terraform is sort of like Git, right? It's free, it's a command line based tool, it's open source, you know, people have it installed on their laptop or, or workstation and kind of developers are using it, uh, you know, every day from their, their CLI versus Terraform Cloud, right? And same sort of analogy to Git, right? Free, open source, et cetera, versus GitHub is sort of the centralized management platform, right? It's sort of like, great, you have a bunch of people using Git, but how do they collaborate with one another? And so in that sense, like GitHub, it's bit for bit the same Git, right? But it's about that workflow and that sort of collaboration layer built on top and around the, the Git tool. So Terraform to Terraform Cloud is sort of the exact same analogy, right? Terraform free, open source, command line based, developers out on their laptop, Terraform Cloud is about that central collaboration, central management of how do I have 20 people use Terraform and not step on each other's toes all the time, right? So it's actually bit for bit the same Terraform running inside of Terraform Cloud. It's just how do you collaborate with a team of people around it? So if you're using Terraform and you've embedded it in a product or, you know, a CI CD pipeline or, or whatever, it doesn't change anything for you. Like, great, continue to use Terraform open source just like other people leverage, you know, Git. Uh, but if you want to integrate with sort of a richer API and richer ecosystem, then Terraform Cloud kind of provides that. In the same way that's like, when you think about kind of the web hooks of GitHub, right, like you trigger your CI build or you trigger your sort of artifact management from a, a GitHub sort of web hook, as opposed to trying to like build some sort of kludgy thing around Git. So I think that's what we're trying to kind of uh, create that same ecosystem. Yeah. Um, speaking of, of APIs and, and ecosystems, uh, earlier you spoke to uh, organizations being very much ITIL and ITSM based, and they're trying to get to a self-service type model. Uh, but being pragmatic, not everyone's going to be able to get there uh, in, in one big jump. So uh, can you talk to us a little bit about how uh, your products integrate with those ITSM solutions so that if you're still in a ticket-based environment, you're, you're not losing track of that. Totally, I, I, I love this. So I think one of the fun, uh, one of the fun little inside jokes is so like you know my co-founder's name is Mitchell Hashimoto, and so the company sort of takes after his last name. And I think one of the fun tidbits is one meaning of Hashi uh, in Japanese is bridge, right? Uh, and so we sort of talk about this internally, which like part of our goal is to acknowledge the fact that yeah, this is not a transition you're going to do in a day or a week or a month. And so it's this question of like, how do you bridge between old and new, right? Because this is, for most companies, you know, it took them eight years to do their VMware migration, right? Like that was just from bare metal to VMware. That's a relatively straightforward transition. So this idea that we're going to go from, you know, a traditional ITIL to, you know, DevOps in six months is 
you know, I think woefully mistaken for most organizations. So we view it as a long-term transition and you have to kind of be a bridge as, as you kind of operate in both of these worlds. So, you know, kind of specifically, you know, there's things like, hey, we do integrations with uh, ITSM systems like ServiceNow, right? So you can actually have an integration between ServiceNow where you say, I file a ticket to request, a, you know, some resources get provision, but you can have Terraform wired behind that to automate the fulfillment of it. Right. So from a user's perspective, who's used to that ticket driven workflow, it doesn't break their interface. I still file a ticket. But now from the back end, if I'm the southbound provider, I can automate the delivery of it. Right. So I think that's just like a very specific example of like, how does that actually work? But then I think if we talk about any of our tools, you can kind of see how the bridging works. Like, great, you can use Terraform to provision AWS and Azure and Google. You can also use it to manage VMware or the Dell Lights Out controller, right? If you're, you know, turning up and down physical machines in the data center, right? Same thing with Vault, right? I think a big use case for us is things like managing Active Directory service accounts on-premise, right? Sort of a traditional use case in an on-premise world where you have AD uh, as sort of the heart of how things get managed. You know, same thing with console. We'll talk about it later today, but I think a big challenge is great. We talk about service mesh and it's shiny and buzzy and, and sort of future looking, but the practical reality is you know, I have hardware firewalls and hardware load balancers and hardware API gateways. How do those get automated? How do those get sort of DevOpsified, right? Versus saying, you know, pull the ripcord, move everything to software defined network, uh, you know, cause it's just an impractical transition. So I think at each layer we try and say, hey, pragmatically, what does the reality look like? Cause I think, you know, sort of how I tried to frame it at the beginning is sort of acknowledging that, you know, this private data center world here isn't going anywhere. Right. And so when we talk about the cloud operating model, it's really about how do I have a single workflow that spans all this and acknowledge there's going to be a whole bunch of baggage uh, in the old world that we need to kind of bring along with us. So I love that question. Oh, sorry for the long answer. <laughs> so I think if we're talking about console, there's sort of two very high level use cases, right, that are, you know, relatively distinct to talk about. Right? One is what we refer to as network infrastructure automation. And so with this use case, I think, you know, to your question, this really goes back to, you know, hey, what if I have more traditional infrastructure? You know, how does that kind of get brought along? So I think if you look at a classic deployment pattern, if I have a web app and it wants to talk to, let's say, a database, there's probably a few pieces of middleware there, right? One of them is almost in def, you know, definitely going to be a, a firewall. And the second is going to be a load balancer, right? There might be API gateways as well. But the web server, when it wants to talk to the database, is most likely going to hard code a VIP. So we're going to use a virtual IP as sort of the name of our upstream service, right? The firewall is going to act as an authorization mechanism, right? So it's going to say IP1 can talk to IP2. But really what we're saying is the web server can talk to the database, right? And then the load balancer is acting as a routing mechanism, right? So if I have multiple databases and I'm doing, you know, active standby, or I have, you know, 10 API servers and I want to load balance across them, that's sort of a routing function that we're playing, right? So I think in this classic world, one of the challenges we see is there's a ton of attention that goes into how do I automate these edges, right? So I'm gonna adopt Kubernetes, I'm gonna adopt different CI CD systems to allow me to you know, have my developers deploy their web app 10 times a day and scale it up and down. And then, you know, great, you've put your web app in an auto scaler and it booted 10 new copies. And now you have to file a ticket for someone to update the firewall, right? And now, you know, please wait 10 days. Right. So there's this sort of disconnect of we're trying to get super automated at the edges of the system, but then the middle of the system isn't automated. Right. It's like that's going to take, you know, days, weeks, you know, to actually snap to it. So I think this is where in this use case we look at and say, well, how do you automate the network infrastructure as well and make it a bit more application centric? So how we think about console's role here is really, again, goes back to that picture of like, what's the system of coordination? Right. The API that I want for my developer is when you deploy your new service, you just publish to console, right? So you automatically register and say, hey, there's a new web server running at IP1, for example, right? Then the southbound API is for our NetOps teams to actually subscribe to this and say, great, I'm going to define a rule that says the web server is allowed to talk to the database, right? But I don't actually care. Is there one web server, 10 web servers, 1,000 web servers? You know, it's all the same. I want to automatically update the firewall and basically subscribe anytime a publish takes place, right? And same thing with the load balancer, same thing with an API gateway. 
And so you get into basically a sort of a pub sub model where you say, great, the northbound API is anytime you deploy a thing you publish, the southbound APIs will subscribe and automatically update the gateway, the load balancer, the firewall sort of for you, right? And so what I think gets super neat about this is you move from a world where you say, I deploy my web app and then I file a bunch of tickets to I deploy my web app, it registers with console automatically, and then that triggers a bunch of downstream automation. So a few seconds later, great, my web app can talk to the database. There's no tickets, there's no manual intervention. If my web app dies or Kubernetes reschedules it on a different pod, all of that's sort of automated, right? I don't have to think about it. And I think in this is very much looking at kind of that traditional world where there's a hardware device possibly there, or it's a central appliance that's running, right? And so I think the way this works, right, is these subscriptions are ultimately driven as code, right? It still goes back to the notion of everything is as code. So it's infra as code. So I define the subscription as let's say a Terraform blueprint. And what console's really doing is saying, great, the set of web servers that exists, I'm gonna package that up as a set of variables for Terraform. And we're gonna invoke Terraform automatically anytime something changes on the network, right? So the person who owns the Terraform configuration, it's still the NetOps person, right? The networking team still has control. So it's not like developers can randomly change the configuration of the load balancer or randomly change the configuration of the firewall. It's still very well defined through a Terraform config as code, but then the actual variables of which IPs are there, that's all out of side. So I think the other kind of distinct use case, and I think this is where the, the more, the buzz of the day is, you know, sort of the buzzword du jour, uh, is, is service mesh, right? I think before, you know, it was called service mesh, you know, we refer to it as a notion of kind of software defined networking or software defined access. But I think the kind of high level idea here is, you know, the whole notion of putting a firewall in the middle of the network or putting a load balancer as a hardware device in the middle of the network sort of implies that you have a middle of your network, right? Like that kind of made sense when you owned a physical network topology and yeah, there's a core router and things like that. But what does it mean when you exist in you know, Amazon or Azure or Google? What's the middle, right? That doesn't exist. And so I think you can start to rethink about it and recast the sort of function that lived as hardware to functions that live as software, right? So if I were to kind of summarize at a very high level, you know, I think the key impacts of, uh, of service mesh, I think it's two. One is a movement towards zero trust networking, right? So I'm just gonna keep layering on buzzwords, but I think the idea here is really a motion of explicit whitelist, right? And what I mean by that is what we see in kind of classic networking is great, you're on my private subnet, you're implicitly allowed to talk to everything else on that subnet, right? So there wasn't an explicit rule that said the web server can talk to database. It was like, well, I had to put both of them in the right subnet. So implicitly they're allowed to talk to each other. So I think when we talk about zero trust, it's sort of a movement away from that saying, no, unless there's a rule that says web server to database or web server to API server, it's not allowed, right? It's sort of a default deny policy, right? So I think that's an important aspect. I think the other one is we're moving away from sort of central hardware into thinking about it as distributed software, right? And so I think how that actually manifests is the notion of you run proxies everywhere, right? So if I have my web server and my API server, right? They're getting deployed alongside a proxy. So this proxy could be, you know, Envoy, uh, which is sort of, you know, very popular for this use case, could be HA proxy, could be Nginx, could be et cetera, right? It doesn't really, you know, I think there's a lot of choices here. There's a lot of good solutions, right? But I think the idea of these proxies is they start to replace these functions, right? And so what does this actually look like in practice? Well, instead of the VIP, when our web server wants to talk to the API, the name, if you will, is always the local proxy. Right, so if I wanna talk upstream, I'm always talking to my local proxy. The local proxy is then querying console as sort of a central control plane and saying, hey, I'm trying to connect to my upstream API service. How many instances are there? Where are they? What are their IPs? Or are there access rules that I should know about? Are we doing a blue green? Are we traffic splitting, et cetera? So the proxies are sort of working with the control plane to have that data, but ultimately they connect directly proxy to proxy, right? And so we're sort of skipping the notion of there being middleware here, right? The middleware insofar as it exists is proxies running at the edge. It's not a firewall in the middle of the network, right? So this means the outgoing proxy is responsible for that routing decision that historically we would have said is the responsibility of this load balancer over here, right? The receiving proxy is then responsible for effectively being the firewall, right? So it's gonna be responsible for the authorization decision. So it's gonna go and query console and say, hey, 
should this web service be allowed to talk to me? Is there some rule that says something like web server to database is allowed, right? Or web server to database might be, or, I'm sorry, in this case, API service. Uh, is it allowed or is it you know, explicitly denied, right? And so if it's allowed, great, we're gonna terminate that connection and allow it to talk back to the API service. If it's disallowed, then we're gonna drop the connection and fire off an audit warning that says, some random web service tried connecting to me, it's not authorized, I don't know what's happening, right? And so how does this work at a very high level, right? We need some notion of identity, right? So if we're gonna have a rule that says web server to API, then you know, how do we know it's a web server connected to us and not just some random thing on the network? And so we're gonna move everything towards using TLS everywhere. So both sides will have a TLS certificate. These certificates are gonna embed the identity of the application. And we're gonna force that they speak mutual TLS between one another, right? So this gives us a strong notion of cryptographic identity. I know it's a web server on one side and an API service on the other, but I'm also have an encrypted channel. So I don't have to worry about is my network confidential or secure, right? This goes back to this kind of notion of zero trust I don't want to trust that my private network is somehow secure, right? As we've seen, you know, even Google's networks get, you know, get tapped by, you know, nation state intelligence, right? So you don't want to trust your network. You want to rely on encryption sort of everywhere, right? So at a super high level, I think this encapsulates the service mesh use case. This is this move where kind of these core network functions, naming, routing, authorization, move from middleware into sort of software at the edge. But that requires a sort of a control plane that's orchestrating all that, right? What are the rules? Who's allowed to talk to who? Where are different services running, et cetera? And then I think there's the question of, okay, well, that's great. This looks like, you know, science fiction utopia. Uh, you know, what about the real world, right? What about the fact that I have existing networks? What about the fact that I have, you know, I think there was a great question about like, if I have a managed service through something like RDS, right? That RDS is not gonna speak, you know, service mesh. So how do I actually manage access to that? Right. So I won't take too much and uh, spend too much detail because I think there's a bunch of cool demos coming up on exactly this, but I'll sketch at a very high level, which is part of our reality. And this goes back to pragmatism is acknowledging and saying, hey, it's going to be multiple different things going on here. So I might have my modern Kubernetes based app. Where I say, cool, my web server and my API server, they're modern and mesh enabled. They're going to talk directly to one another. Then I'm going to have my old school on-premise world, right? I maybe have a database. It's going to be secured by a firewall till the end of time, right? Because we're not going to put that, our Oracle rack cluster anytime soon in the service mesh. And so here's where we have a notion of what we call terminating gateways. And the idea behind them is they sort of act as a bridge between old and new worlds. So if my web server wants to talk to the database, it's actually talking through a gateway, which itself is actually just Envoy with a special configuration. And it's going to enforce that, hey, is there a rule that says the web server is allowed to talk to Oracle Rack, right? So there's still an identity-based rule that's going to be enforced. And if so, great, then we're going to terminate, and hence the name, and speak plain TCP back. And so this still allows us to have a static firewall rule that says, great, IP1 and IP2, right, in this case, you know, just the terminating gateway, are allowed to talk. And so we're able to kind of bridge old and new, right? The new things can be purely mesh enabled. The old things can be, you know, firewall enabled. And again, this can be driven. You know, we can be doing the network infrastructure automation on the left-hand side as well, but we can actually bridge these two worlds, right? Similarly, if we have a cloud managed service, right? We might say I have something like RDS, right? We can apply the same sort of a technique, right? And do a network kind of ring-based approach. So we say there's a terminating gateway for our managed services, let's say in Amazon, and we define a network ring. So the only things within the ring are the terminating gateway and the different managed services. So I might have multiple RDSs or you know, S3 private endpoint, et cetera. There might be a bunch of stuff in here, but the only way into this ring is through the terminating gateway, right? So great, I'd still go through this. There's a rule that says, can the web server talk to my RDS instance, right? And if so, great, we'll go kind of, you know, this will sort of allow us to hole punch into that sort of inner network ring, right? So there's a bunch of other kind of pieces in this, which is what if you have a legacy thing that wants to kind of come inward, right? So I might have a Java app that wants to speak in sort of the input direction. So here's where you have things like ingress. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but you know, there's multiple kind of pieces here. I think the practical reality, the pragmatic reality is you're not gonna you know, boil the ocean and move everything to service mesh, right? So how do you have old and new and cloud managed services all interop uh, kind of gracefully? But I think that kind of tees up the high level of how we think about console. It's about existing infrastructure. How do we automate it and get efficiencies there? And then new school world, service mesh world, how do we move to zero trust? How do we move to sort of 
uh, a pure software approach to the problem. So I'll kind of pause there. Yeah. So, so do you run into situations where uh, you're in these mixed world environments where there's, you know, kind of the old school guys and the, and the newer guys and usually in those environments, people are in different silos. Uh, when there's a problem and you have to start troubleshooting, uh, you know, do people say, hey, you know, maybe console is making things a little too complex for us? Um, and, and if you do get that sort of response, what's, you know, how do you, uh, how do you counter that? Yeah, that's a super, super good question. So I think there's kind of two sides to this, right? I think, you know, one of the most common things that we see go wrong, especially at the network level, is what I'll call kind of sort of the human-induced fat finger, <laughs> right? It's like the traffic's not working because someone deleted a firewall rule that should be there, or they sort of fat fingered the wrong IP in, uh, and things like that. And these can be super hard to diagnose because you're like, hey, I can see that the web server's registered. I see it's registered in, you know, maybe a system like console or our CMDB in a more traditional setting. Why isn't the traffic going through? And I think what's tough is because you're not doing it as infrastructure as code, you basically have to do a reconcile at like a record by record label, right? You literally have to log in and be like, did you type in the, the correct IP address, right? Because that's the level at which sort of the source of truth exists, right? Versus I think when you start to adopt a, this type of a model, the thing you can audit is basically the infrastructure as code definition. I can review the Terraform and say, great, is it configuring my Palo Alto correctly or configuring my F5 device correctly, right? And what I don't have to worry about is did someone fat finger an IP in, right? So if I can look in console and be like, hey, the service is registered and it has the correct IP, well, I know I'm driving it through automation. So unless I have like a really whacked up Terraform config that's like rewriting IPs for some strange reason, right? I should avoid that type of sort of error. And so what it lets me reconcile is I don't have to look at 10,000 firewall rules. I can look at the one infrastructure's code definition that is generating those 10,000 rules, right? So it lets me actually do my debugging at a much higher level rather than sort of at the super low level, kind of painful level to kind of look at things. So I think from that aspect on the left-hand side, I think it makes life easier, right? Because you're sort of looking at sort of the meta control rather than the individual controls. On the right-hand side, I think it's a bit more complicated because I think historically you depended on Great, if something's going wrong with my network, I can look at you know the counting and the telemetry generated by my load balancer or my, my, by my firewall. And those are gonna give me different counters of error rates, latencies, things like that. But now if I'm saying on the right-hand side, those aren't intermediaries, right? I'm not going through them, now what, right? I think the reality is all of these proxies, whether it's Envoy, Nginx, HA proxy, they all do a great job exporting telemetry. So I think it's a different mental model, right? The old mental model is I log into the load balancer and I look at the telemetry it has. I think the new approach is, great, I wire it up to Datadog. All my agents are streaming telemetry up to Datadog and I log in there and I have a dashboard that gives me sort of an aggregate view, right? So I think in the same way we're going from central hardware to distributed software, we're going from sort of central telemetry, sort of distributed gathering of telemetry, but sort of centralized dashboard uh, in terms of how we actually analyze it. Um, so it's different, but I wouldn't say it's necessarily worse. So oh, Armin, can you talk to us a little bit about the other problem that you get into this, which is it's great when I can trust the control plane. So mm -hmm. when I'm looking in, in console and I'm and, and I'm sending data up to Datadog or whatever my uh, telemetry tool and correlation thing is, is great. And when I'm talking service to service without firewalls and, and, and other abstracts that we're using in the data center, the transition is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. Today, when I'm, I, I just, I, I can't stand the fact that I have to manage, I have to manually manage certificates for my IPAM or I mean, certificates for my out of bound uh, drag or ILO or whatever management tool, that by itself is a nightmare. How are we managing identity in this new environment? But more specifically, because I think when we get to like centralized certificate management and, and et cetera, that's great. But the transition to that is really difficult. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. So let me switch back to this third slide we had, which is, you know, I think what you're pointing out is in the old world, we didn't have a strong notion of identity, right? I think IP was the identity unit, right? So if I talked about the controls I'd put in place, the firewall would talk about what's allowed to talk to IP one, right? It didn't have a notion of this is Oracle rack and like, what does that mean from an identity perspective? So 
I, I, you know, I think if I kind of maybe rephrasing the question, it's how do I go from a world where my unit of identity is sort of IP, it's this sort of physical thing, right? Uh, to really, I want a logical unit of identity. I want to talk about the Oracle Rack service, the web service, the API service. And the fact is the physical reality of you know, the web service might be there's 50 IPs and they change all the time because it's on Kubernetes and it's auto scaling, right? So the physical control actually matters less to me, right? Than the lot, than sort of the security of that logical control. Like how do I make sure something else doesn't pretend to be a web server, right? How do I have kind of confidence that when I say this thing is a web server or this thing is an API service, that it kind of is what it is, right? And that's a super, super good question. I think, you know, there's sort of two ways to look at this, which is, I think in the IP control world, this is almost a bottom up lens, right? I provision a VM, my IPAM solution assigns an IP to it. And then I file a ticket against the firewall team saying, hey, I have, you know, IP six, you know, create the control for me. And so in that sense, the physical control is sort of bottom up. You weren't like this. It's not like, you know, 10.0.5.6 means something special to me. I don't really care, right? It just happened to be that, that was the IP I got, right? Versus I think identity fundamentally has to be top down, right? I think it's very hard to go in from an identity world where you say, I'm going to boot a bunch of VMs. I don't know what the hell they are. And then I'm going to come back post talk and try and figure out what they are and assign identity, right? And so I think this, you know, very much ties into things like infrastructure as code, right? Which is, you know, if I'm going to try and apply this model on the right, but not do it in an automated way, not do it in a way where it's being driven sort of top down based on a model, I think it's, I won't say impossible, but I'll say close to impossible, right? Because you're going to be trying to kind of bootstrap identity onto a system that doesn't have it. Versus if, let's say, the way this is getting developed is, well, there's a Terraform module, right? For example, as I'm going to use that as an example, but it could be Ansible or something else. Um, and this defines sort of in code, how does a web service get deployed? How does an API service get deployed? Well, then as part of that deployment, I'm encoding its identity, right? In Kubernetes, because that's sort of the platform I've chosen here, that might get encoded as something like a service account. So in addition to deploying, you know, the deployment and the service label, I'm also going to deploy a service account that allows me to sort of bind it and have a strong definition of what does it mean to be a web service, right? If I wasn't using Kubernetes and this was just straight up on top of, you know, AWS, let's say, and this is EC2, I might create an appropriate EC2 role for it and then bind that to something inside of, uh, you know, create a role binding for that VM that's coming up and say, great, deploy this VM, but bind it particularly to this special role. So that I have a stronger notion of the identity of this application, right? But what you can see is that this is fundamentally a top-down process. I'm assigning the identity as part of my intention, as part of my top-down model. But I think that's a really good point. So I think as we're going through this transition, if you say, hey, I have this universe that's all defined bottom up and I want to move to this universe that's defined top down, right? How do I do it? And in some sense, I think the answer is incrementally, right? Great, the first new app that comes in the new world is let's say the web service. I'm gonna define its identity top down. I'm gonna bridge that to my old world through technologies like this terminating gateway, right? So I'm gonna just ignore the fact that my old world is still just completely driven by IP and physical control. I'm gonna bridge between them for the time being. And then I'm gonna incrementally migrate things sort of from sort of the bottom up IP world into the top down identity world. Yeah, what will be interesting, maybe we can talk about it in the lounge after the presentation, is that organizationally, like that organizational change, because in the new the new world I get, and I get change management in the new world, I get change management in the old world. What I don't get is change management across the two. So as, and when I, when I mean change management, I mean literally when the auditor comes in to say, hey, show me that this service can talk to this service and that's allowed. Right. In the two worlds, I get to how to do that in the two individual worlds is when I start to have that crosstalk and, and making the organizational change right. from a process perspective, not from a technology perspective, but from a process perspective to have this conversation. Totally. Yeah. And I think what it comes back to is, to your point, I think it's like you have to think about almost these two efforts as running in parallel, right? Which is, you know, as I'm adopting kind of the modern service mesh identity world, how do I start to get that same automation of the traditional world? And as I do that, it simplifies those kind of questions, right? My auditor asks, how does this work? I can say, great. Well, I actually have two different sets of rules I can look at. One is here, which is 
this is the set of rules that's ultimately being enforced at the load balancer level or the firewall level, et cetera. And then I have a separate set of rules that's being enforced in an identity level and the merger of that. But I take your point, which is in that transition period, you're gonna have things that are not under management. Uh, and it's the same it's the same pain that you're sort of experiencing today. And so the question is how do we sort of chip away at that incrementally? That's a great point. Yeah, and it sounds like there also may need to be some, some level of uh, knowledge sharing with security folks who are doing those auditing, the, who are conducting the audits so that you can help them understand, hey, you know what, I'll show you the firewall rule set, but then I also need to show you my infrastructure as code on the other end uh, to help make, you know, draw the full picture. Yeah, and I think what we've seen is, you know, I think at first security teams are sort of, you know, maybe opposed to like, ah, it seems like it's gonna add more complexity is, you know, yet another thing for me to think about. But I think once they start to see the light, which is, hey, your firewall has 2 million rules on it today, right? So you're trying to understand that 2 million rules because you're doing it at this physical control level creates this immense sort of N squared explosion of rules. Versus if I really boil it down and say the whole you know, bank only has a thousand unique you know, applications. So if you said, even if every app needed to talk to every other app, that'd be a, a million logical rules, right? At your upper bound versus you have 2 million physical rules. The practical reality is each of those apps only talks to five, six different services. So your logical set of rules would only be about call in the neighborhood of five to 10,000 logical rules versus 2 million physical rules. And so I think once they start to see that reality of, yeah, because I'm decoupling from the physical reality of do I have one, 10 or 50 web servers, it's just one logical rule at the service level. It actually reduces the scope of audit and reduces what I have to actually deal with from some crazy number in the millions to some manageable number in the thousands, right? So I think once they see that writing on the wall, I think security teams actually get quite excited about, hey, this is a dramatic simplification. But to your point, yeah, hearts and minds. <laughs> so a quick question, we're talking about the tracing and you know, someone fat fingering an issue and you mentioned you know, being able to have that visibility through a tool like a Datadog or Grafana or Prometheus, or some kind of analytics platform. Is there plans for like a one plus one equals three HashiCorp tool that manages those pieces as well? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think from our perspective, I think there's a ton of good solutions in the sort of the APM space. So I don't think uh, we're certainly not keen on going and rebuilding the good work that, you know, folks like Datadog and, and others have done. I think for us, it's more looking at how do we have a much tighter integration? So, you know, some of the stuff that's on our roadmap that we've shared is things like much tighter Splunk integration, much tighter Datadog integration, right. uh, and making it so that, you know, those visualizations and things can be sort of inlined in, into the user experience to get that one plus one equals three without having to kind of, you know, rebuild the wheel. Right, because even if you just use the default out of the, the, the box stock uh, dashboards from Datadog, you still got a lot of work to go. Like you're, you're, right. you, you're seeing some data, but you're not making sense of data yet. Exactly, so I think that's where there's the one plus one equals three opportunity, which is like, right. great, can we auto wire it into Datadog? but then have an opinionated view of how that gets presented back out through console that's contextualized. So it's not just, here's an ocean of telemetry, good luck. Yeah, exactly.